Hi, welcome to The New Normal, creating safe cultures that engage employees, psychological safety and organizational inclusion with Dr. Richard Ray and Dr. Evie Maxey at Anderson University. Thank you for your attention. And thanks to Amy Edmondson for letting us use this slide from her website, which is amyedmondson.com. Psychological safety in organizations isn't new, but in the context of inclusion and diversity, it is. We could even get back to Edward Stemmings in the 40s, who talked about driving out fear so that people can work more effectively in their company. This is what we're going to be discussing in our time together, the foundation of safety, belonging, and teams. What is psychological safety? The four stages of psychological safety? Creating psychological safety in the organization? And how we can have inclusion with psychological safety? Here are some reasons why people are afraid of speaking up in organizations. Perhaps someone is concerned, will someone even listen to me? Or would I get respect? Or are people going to do things behind my back? Or maybe there are even some consequences from sharing my views, or maybe even an extreme example of being fired for speaking up. So psychological safety really isn't new. We've been talking about it for quite a while. We used the Deming's reference earlier. But m many of you who've been trained in human resources or organizational behavior will remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So essentially what we're looking at is before we can move up the, the hierarchy, we have to satisfy the lower level needs, the basic needs. So things like water, uh, rest, comfort. And then as we meet that need, we move into the security needs. Do we feel safe? And then social needs, love and belonging, esteem needs around accomplishment and achievement. And at this point, you start to see us move from this basic human physical need to more of the emotional and psychological need related to what we are going to call psychological safety. And then eventually we move up to self-actualization according to Maslow. Over the past few years, we've had other people try to introduce new concepts related to needs, including the need to know or the need to acquire knowledge and the need for beauty or the need for an understanding that there's more than just the physical and emotional. Another model as we think about uh, psychological safety that we can rely on um, is Tuckman's uh, team formation model, where essentially over time, uh, the team becomes more effective. We form, we storm, we norm, and we perform. And of course, as we have new members come in, as they engage us, as they stretch the definitions of the previous team, these four stages can repeat themselves and members can come in and come out, but the stages stay remain. The leader's role here is to make sure that the team is self-reliant and can continue to move on to the point where at at some time, the team may be able to be self-directed and operate independently. So what is psychological safety? We're going to provide you a couple of definitions, but before we provide those definitions, let's go back to an old tried and true way of helping people think about things, the use of the parable. People have been using parables and metaphors for millennia to help people understand complex issues. And psychological safety, as important as it is, is, is a complex issue. So I'm going to use an example that a colleague at Anderson University shared with me a few years ago. Bummer lambs are these little lambs that are born in the uh, flock. And sometimes, for any given reason, the mother in the flock will reject that bummer lamb. It might be a color issue. It could be a formation around the, the head. It could be a texture. It just could be a feel that the other lambs and other uh, sheep have with that little lamb. And at some point, they begin to push out that lamb. And, and literally, they push him out of the flock. And in some cases, they force the lamb into the wilderness. Well, when the lamb goes into the wilderness, that lamb is unprotected. Um, they're subject to the environment. They're subject to wolves. They're subject to any type of harm 
uh, that can end in their demise. And so what a shepherd has to do is they have to identify those lambs and they have to help those lambs feel like they belong there and feel like they're part of the flock. Sometimes this means they actually go and they leave the sheep that they already have in a safe place and they they actually go out and and put themselves at harm to pull that sheep back. In many cases, what we see is they'll sleep with that sheep, they'll hold that sheep close to them, they'll nurture them, they'll make those sheep feel very, uh, very loved to the point that they can survive on their own, and then they reintroduce them to that flock. And so we can use this metaphor to think about how we look at people in the workplace and how psychological safety works. It's up to the leader to create a place of trust and respect, caring and belonging. And it's up to the leader to help make sure that every person in the organization feels like they're valued and included. So as we go forward, I want you to think about this parable and keep it uh, just in the back of your mind as we talk about this very complex issue of psychological safety and inclusion. Psychological safety is attributed to the work of Amy Edmondson, and she defines it as a belief that one will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes, and the team is safe for interpersonal risk-taking. To that end, in fostering a culture of psychological safety, where individuals feel like they can express their ideas, they raise concerns, they ask questions, even challenge the process, or offer divergent views without feeling afraid. And that is fearing unfavorable feedback and impact from their team. And it is absolutely essential that organizations have trust and respect before that psychological safety can exist. And we'll continue to talk about trust and respect as we uh, move through our presentation. In fact, when we talk about psychological safety, when you don't have trust and you don't have that respect for each other, um, you have a culture that is psychologically uh, dangerous. We actually call it psychological danger. And essentially people, as Dr. Max has said, fear making mistakes. They begin to blame each other when those mistakes are made. They're less likely to share different views or less likely to encourage each other for, for uh, fear of being blamed. And then there's this common knowledge effect. After a while, we get into a, a behavior and a pattern where the, the language that's reinforced is this blaming language. So people don't take risks. They don't change. Uh, they, they become a stagnant organization and a negative culture um, emerges. Uh, in essence, we're playing not to lose. This is a Larry Wilson concept that in many organizations, we're not working together to win. We're actually um, figuring out how not to lose. And sometimes when we're playing not to lose, we actually sabotage uh, other people in our culture. We actually uh, put people in a, in a situation where um, they can't be successful in order to make us look successful. And so when we think about psychological performance, members, um, they have a decreased, uh, decreased productivity level, um, there's lower morale, less likely for people to take the initiative. Um, there's typically a high turnover in teams that uh, we uh, term as psychologically uh, danger cultures. Um, conflict is unresolved and unproductive, so you have a lot of um, covert conversations uh, where people are creating resistance. And when we look at overall performance, error rates, and low quality, um, we see some incredible issues around um, uh, lower performance. So Dr. Ray shared the danger zone of what psychological right, safety right, is right. not. Now let's discuss what psychological safety is. And so while the danger zone is about fear and compliance, uh, psychological safety really emphasizes the learning and the growth. And that's where we want to hone in. We want to play to win. <laughs> so how do we succeed? Uh, how can we promote innovation in our organizations um, such that everyone feels like they're free to innovate um, without that risk of failure or making a mistake? And what's really interesting is we can walk into a, uh, an organization 
And in about 10 minutes, you can identify, are they a psychological safe place or is it more psychological danger? We don't need advanced uh, assessments to do that. We can talk to employees and figure that out pretty quick. We, we can, can't we? Since that almost immediately, right? Yeah. So psychological safety is really important because we know from the research that um, we have better employee well-being, there's greater collaboration. When you look at things like turnover, um, inclusion, when we talk about total team performance, all of those things improve when we have psychologically safe uh, cultures. Um, in fact, we can even throw some numbers into this. Um, there's uh, several studies that looks at the return on investment. 29% um, uh, more life satisfaction by employees who work in psychologically safe organizations. 57% um, uh, feel they're more collaborative. Um, uh, when we look at productivity, organizations that are psychologically safe um, often have, report 50% higher. Um, some other statistics up here, but one of my favorites is the one up top, and that's there's a higher probability that when you send people to learning and training, uh, when they get continued education, when they earn a degree, when they go to a workshop, there's a 60%, 67% chance that they're going to apply that. Wow. And, and I mean, and that, that's almost like a return on investment in a return on investment. And so it's kind of neat to see how, how that plays out in psychologically safe organizations, especially when you're spending $600 billion a year on training and development. So it really comes down to whether you want a psychologically safe organization or an organization that operates in the danger zone. And so it's important here because you get to make a decision as an executive, as a leader in HR, um, even as a team leader, you're determining what the culture looks like in your, in your organization. And so it, again, comes back to trust and respect, like Dr. Maxey said earlier. Um, and if trust isn't established, then you'll never get to that point where you have a psychologically safe culture. Okay. And who's responsible for that? The leaders, right? And it doesn't matter if you're a first-line leader or the head of a major bank. If you don't support psychological safety in your organization, uh, you don't get the benefit of it. You don't see those that return on investment we talked about earlier. And this is just simply, you know, Sean's approach to culture. Leaders define culture. Culture determines what's successful, who's successful. They become the leaders within that culture. And um, you know, it's, it's, it's a simple, uh, very simple proposition. WD-40 is an excellent example yeah. of what we're discussing here is psychological safety. And their CEO, Gary Ridge, he creates this constant learning culture where team members can uh, have candor, they can ask each other questions, they make mistakes, but each individual has that accountability for learning and for asking questions. In fact, there's the maniac pledge that every team member at WD-40 must take before they're employed there. And we're now going to show you a quick clip um, of all the employees citing the Maniac Pledge. Yeah, so just click here on this link. So what if we all had the Maniac Pledge or something similar in our organizations? I really encourage you to ponder that and think about implementing it as a leader in your organizations uh, such that you're fostering that psychologically safe environment in that culture on a daily basis. And thinking, if I don't have an answer, then I'll get you one. I'll go find out. I'll take that initiative. And so we all take responsibility and really it eliminates unnecessary drama and the need for micromanagement. And so the CEO has this signature line attached to every email of an Italian for I'm still learning. And Michelangelo um, frequently signed his paintings with that as well. <laughs> so let's keep that in mind. Well, we continue. Are you going to start uh, signing all so your I, emails? So I like may that? not be Michelangelo, but I've been called a maniac. But I, but I do think I do think that you know we this does give us an opportunity to really point out the difference between what psychological safety looks like and and what it doesn't look like in teams. And so when we when we take that maniac pledge, it gives us an opportunity to really say you know this is different, right? And so so when we think about when we think about it, you know it is you know we we know there's a difference in performance uh, 
between a, a team that has that freedom to express and learn and continue learning and one that, you know, people are going to be resistant to change, people are going to be resistant to innovation. They're not going to think outside of the box for fear that someone's going to close the box off. So. And it all starts with the leader. It all starts with the leader. So if you're trying to figure out, do you have a psychological safe team or are you in the danger zone? Um, Amy Edmondson and her work in the 1990s up through even most recently, uh, 2018, she developed these questions that you can ask. And these can be used, you don't have to have a PhD or you don't have to be a psychometrician. You can just pull together a group of employees and you can have a nice discussion, a focus group. Um, so, you know, if you make a mistake on your team, you know, is it held against you? I mean, that's, that's a real, that's a real honest question. Um, you know, people, uh, you know, sometimes reject me for being different. I mean, these are simple questions, but you can just imagine trying to facilitate this with a group of people. Uh, and sometimes you might do it yourself as a leader. You might ask your team these questions. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's just a nice, simple way of determining how the psychological um, safety work. Now, if, if there are more sophisticated ways to do it, we even have a 35 item uh, survey that we use to dive into what leadership looks like in the psychological safety environment, what teams look like in a psychological safety environment, and how we look at inclusion. We're not going to cover that in this presentation, but feel free to reach out to Dr. Maxey or me, and we can discuss that with you in the future. Absolutely. So there are formal ways to think about psychological safety, and, and we've talked about some of those. Um, but just walking into an organization, as we said earlier, you can, you can do a quick evaluation. You know, are mistakes seen as a learning opportunity? Um, it always reminds me of the Jack Welch story where he says, you know, he was ready to resign. He boxed up his office. He, you know, he, he lost $10 million in this project. And then he went to the CEO and said, you know, here's the problem. Here's the mistake I made. Here's my letter of resignation. And the letter, and the CEO looked at him and said, you idiot. Why would I fire you? I just trained you. It just cost me $10 million to train you, right? Right. And so mistakes are treated as learning opportunity. And that's not to say we want to do crazy things, right? right. But it is to say that um, we are going to make mistakes. And how we leverage that learning is really important. And actually, that leads us to more of a, a, a continuous improvement, strategic uh, process where learning and adaptation are just part of what we do. But you can't have that unless you have it in, in a psychologically safe environment. Uh, performance reviews are, are seen again as an improvement opportunity. Um, everyone is taking risk. We're not looking for uh, Dr. Maxey to come in and try something new and then take shots at her when it doesn't work or to lift her up on a pedestal when it does work. Everybody feels like they can participate in that process. Okay, so we've talked about what it is. We've talked about what it isn't. We've also talked a little bit about um, how we measure it and how we assess it and how you know it exists in an organization and just simple evaluation activities. So now let's talk about what are those stages? How do you, how do you get there, right? Because it's one thing to identify something. It's another thing to talk about how you want to um, make it happen. So let's pause now and consider where we are as a leader and where our other team members are in the organization for these four stages of psychological safety. And let's just, let's dive in. We're going to go into what the key characteristics are for these four stages. Let's take a look at the progression of each of these stages characterized by a psychological safety culture. Number one is absolutely foundational. If we don't have number one, the inclusion safety, oh, let's stop here. Might as well stop the video because we're not able to go any further, are we, right, Dr. Right. Ray? Nope. If you can't get past one, just go ahead and turn off the video now. So. Because we have that fear. Right. We're first going to have to eliminate the fear. So how do we eliminate that fear? Well, it's when we treat others fairly and we feel that our experience and ideals matter and others do as well. And we would, we would include others regardless of their title or their position. There's that openness. You that trust people, right? You trust yeah. people for sure. And with that trust, with that openness, then leads into the learner safety 
doesn't it? Where you can actually start to experiment and you feel like you have that freedom right, to do right, so right, right. because you have trust and not someone's not staying over you. Uh oh, are you going to make a mistake or just waiting to happened? blame you, right? Just back waiting, to danger, waiting to blame. It goes back to that blaming culture. But yeah. after all, we're playing to win. And if we're playing to win, we're all in this together. We're looking for new opportunities where we can continue to learn and explore and discover. Right. Uh, so then that transitions Liz, let's take it now to the next level where we're going to collaborate with right. each other so once we have that inclusion safety we have that learner safety that we're building upon right. so again it's a it's a progression uh, and we learn to interact with each other we maintain the open dialogue we might even have some constructive right. debate. And right, notice right. I, I clarified that with the It's okay to disagree because okay. that's how you learn, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. for sure. It, it is. It's how we disagree, right. how we communicate with each other, that's, how that's, we frame our questions um, so that it's done in, in a collaborative manner. Um, but we can also engage in, in an unconstrained manner because right. after all, we do have that trust. That's right. We have that openness. We feel safe. And then leading us to the ideal level of the challenger right, safety. Right, right. I wonder how many organizations out there really at this level. And and you can consider that right now. Yeah. Can you openly express ideas? Right, right. Can you identify changes and expose problems? And say, wait a minute. No, we've always done it this way, but what if? Pose those questions yeah. and really challenge the status quo. And I think a good place to see this is in healthcare organizations. You're in an operating room, right? So do I feel safe? Uh, you know, am I included? Am I part of the surgery team, even if I am the admissions person, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, am I, um, is, is it okay for me to ask questions to make sure we're operating on the right body part? Um, if, if I see that something's not right, can I raise questions? Do I feel comfortable speaking up? And then you're right. We get to this point of not only are you speaking up, but you're exposing problems and you don't feel like you're going to be playing later if something doesn't go well. To further reiterate, in the inclusion safety stage, that stage one, that's where someone really feels the belongingness and they're, they're accepted for who they are right, and their right. personality, right. any differences they may have. And it all begins with the onboarding and the hiring process yeah. of acclimating someone to a new work environment and the culture and how things are done and, and getting to um, become socialized right. within that environment. So it really is about belonging and getting people to that next stage. It is, indeed. Then with the learner safety, it's primarily focused on the learning, the growth, that overall experience of the learning. So speaking up again and identifying some gaps or shortcomings, even in a training environment, all goes back to having that freedom, mm -hmm. that trust, in order to be able to identify areas for improvement and, and areas for further learning and growth. Making a difference. So we are going to ask these frontline or frontline workers, those that know how a job has to be done, let's get them involved in right. developing, maybe it could be a training manual, how, right. how we right. do things. After all, they're the ones that know what can be improved. Um, we've all seen that show, Undercover Boss, <laughs> <laughs> where the CEO goes to the frontline workers. Um, that would be a prime example of having contributor safety. Um, it's not till the end of the show that those right, frontline right. workers realize they're actually making a difference um, when yeah. they have that final conversation with the CEO. Well, that's a good example because often you'll get a CEO who feels like they can't even contribute in their own company when they're undercover, and then it's that un un unveiling that, oh, wait a minute, this is the person in charge of the culture. They're the one who drives this. They're the one who makes it psychologically safe or not. It's awesome. And making things better. So how how is this going to happen in a psychologically safe culture? Well. It goes back to challenging the status quo, asking those questions that have not been previously asked. Let's take a, another look at our policies, procedures. Do they really make sense? Do, do they align with what we're trying to accomplish and our goals in the organization? Perhaps they don't. All right, well, let's have that culture to, to speak up, allow others to, to voice uh, their opinion and, and make 
needed changes for the overall um, effectiveness of the organization and the benefit of the organization and the team. Yeah, I think this is where you can go back to Dr. Edmondson's questions and ask those questions and, and see what the answers are. That'll give you an idea of what stage um, of a safe culture you're in. So Dr. Max, you pretty clearly explained what the actual uh, stages of uh, psychological safety look like. So now we've, we've done some assessment, we've talked about what it is, what it isn't, we've, we've compared the psychologically danger versus psychologically safe uh, environments, and then Dr. Maxey covered those four stages. So let's talk about what you can do um, as a leader or an HR person to really create that culture. So the first thing is you got to make it a priority, right? It's like anything in the organization that's important, whether it's implementing a new ERP program or whether uh, it's hiring a new employee. If you don't make it a priority, it's not going to happen. That's the same with psychological safety. You've got to have a mindset that this is the way you're going to be. You're going to play to win. You're going to encourage people to speak up. You're going to encourage respectful conflict and collaboration. Um, and so the idea is you are constantly trying to uh, improve trust, and the way you do that is you give feedback and you have conversations with people. Uh, you really want to make sure that people feel like they can contribute. And you know, this isn't uh, this isn't something you can just make happen. You actually have to understand it. Uh, a friend of mine talks about psychological safety in the same way we talk about um, operating a car. Often, people just hop in a car and they drive it where it needs to go. But if something happens or if it breaks down, they don't know how to repair it. And I think that's the way we can think about psychological safety is that you're not just running your organization. You're not just assuming that you're building a good team. You've got to understand how to you know, change the oil on that, that, uh, that team. You've got to understand how to uh, keep it maintained properly. And so um, when we talked about those four stages of psychological safety, you have to be honest and open in developing that. So when we think about psychological safety, if you're an HR leader, what are some things that drive it? What do you think you can do? Well, we know there's some pretty good best practices out there around psychological safety. Yes. Um, making sure that you understand the business case for it. Um, we showed you some pretty clear statistics. We talked about the quantitative and the qualitative ways that we can show uh, it makes it a better organization and that teams are more effective. Um, you can actually talk about it. Right? Don't, don't hide it under a rock. Talk about psychological safety and why it's important. Talk about how it impacts your productivity, inclusion, uh, the way that you recruit people, your employer brand. It impacts so many things. Um, you, can, you can make your organization more empathetic, um, and you can develop cohesion um, by educating your workforce on what psychological safety is. And, and again, you know, we want people to think, you know, this isn't one of those warm, fuzzy things that HR does. This is one of those important strategic things that leaders do. And so if you're not engaged and you're not helping your leaders understand that this isn't an HR initiative, this is about making our organization better, you know, um, you, there, there's going to be other challenges you face as an HR leader. And then be in the constant state of uh, assessing um, what level you're in. And this doesn't mean you have to go out and purchase a you know very expensive survey. This is, you know, taking donuts or a fruit basket or just walking around. Um, you know, in the medical world, we talk about it as rounding. You know, are you actually walking out where the patients are, where the people are? Are you asking them uh, questions? But it's that constant assessment and measurement that's really important. And so there's kind of those three uh, major um, strategies, right? Take a hard look um, at the leaders in your organization. I mean, you've seen leaders in your organization that probably shouldn't have been there and they're probably not going to create a psychologically safe environment. Um, you also see, uh, you know, people who don't really focus on it. And, you know, the, the old joke that, you know, a high performance team and innovation, if you're not, um, if you're not working, um, if you're not trying to improve, if you're not constantly training, then you're actually preparing to fail by not preparing to engage. And so that's really important. Um, and then, you know, again, you can always adopt psychological safe uh, measures. Um, now, Dr. Maxi, this is a couple of the things that I've seen work um, around, like, specific tactics for improving psychological safety. 
Um, any of these speak out to you or have you tried any of these yourself when you work with companies? Wow. The, this presents uh, definitely an excellent overview of multiple ways because we know we have to be very intentional in how we foster our culture, right? right, right. And we have a culture. It's just what type of culture do we have? Uh, definitely in this last one, creating that listening culture. Yeah, yeah, Employees want to know that there's someone who listen. Maybe we don't have all the solutions, but if we're willing to lend an ear to be able to give that employee any time, speak out. In fact, this afternoon at our faculty development session, we're going to have a planning period where we'll get in teams. We're all going to have everyone respond to some questions about where they would like to see the, the College of Business in this next year and how we're going to get there. Nice. Uh, so we're definitely going to uh, have a listening session this afternoon where everyone is going to feel like they can be involved um, as a faculty member here at Anderson University. And so one of the things that I think about when I hear about those uh, employee involvement or faculty involvement activities, and when I look at some of these, is it has to be intentional, right? It's it not, if you don't plan it and you don't encourage it, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. The only one I would caution against is the, um, in hospitals we do a lot of what we call donut runs, where a senior physician or an executive We'll take donuts to an area where maybe employee engagement hasn't been what it needs to be, or maybe they're concerned about wellness of those employees. Um, you just have to make sure you rotate that, or your CEO will gain 20 pounds. Uh -oh. uh, so you want to be a little careful with some of those, those activities. And if we do ask for employees' feedback, we're going to have to follow up, right? That's right. That's right. Is that the um, yeah, that, expectation? Yeah, because if if you you know it's the old uh, you know it's the old adage you see with people you know someone will come to you and they'll say hey do you like my dress well if you give them honest feedback and they're not happy with that feedback I don't like your dress or your dress doesn't go with your hair or whatever um, or do you like the project I worked on well let me tell you I, there's some parts of your project I'm just not so excited about. If you're not open to that feedback because you did ask the question, then you actually send this this really tough message to your workplace that I'm going to ask you questions because some management consultant told me I should do it or some college professor told me I should do it or my boss told me in my performance appraisal I have to ask questions. But if you don't do something with that, then you actually do more harm to the organization because employees get used to you asking but knowing that things aren't going to change. And so, they'll allude to when a previous occurrence of that happened that, and then won't take it seriously when asked again. Mm -hmm. about. And so that's why we, we like to develop these checklists for managers where we talk to them about, uh, you, know, you know, make sure that you're asking questions and then make sure that you have a plan for what you do with what you hear, right? Yes. Make sure that you're active listening, as you talked about earlier. So as you're listening, making sure that you you're letting them talk, you're not just getting ready to talk about what they talked about. Um, you have a psychological uh, plan uh, in place so that every manager knows this is something I need to do today to encourage people to speak up. This is something I need to do today to um, deal with negative behaviors. Um, and so um, we like these types of checklists because they give us an opportunity to make it real for a manager. So. Psychological safety, um, I've heard Dr. Edmondson a few times and I've read her, her uh, materials where psychological safety isn't the thing, it's something that helps the thing happen, right? So psychological right. safety helps performance improve, it helps leaders develop, it helps engage employees. And I think there's probably fewer things that can help you create inclusion, true inclusion in your organization than psychological safety because it it allows you to have these conversations in a safe environment. It allows you to listen to it. It provides a framework for you to, to uh, be included and to learn and collaborate and challenge whatever exists. So that's why I like to apply it to um, inclusion. And so when people feel like they're valued and respected by their peers, you know, the, the research, neurological research, emotional research, physical research, any research discipline you look at, when we feel connected and part of a team, when we feel like we belong and things are, are fair, um, again, it comes back to that trust and respect. If I feel like it exists, then I'm going to be involved or I'm going to feel like I can contribute. And so there's this great model of uh, 
of inclusive cultures where we, there's really a three-step process. And you can think about it in a linear way, but um, you can also think about it more comprehensively, where there's step one of fairness and respect. Step two, you feel like you're valued and you belong to whatever system or whatever group you're part of. And then step three, that's where you you're, you really have that inclusive organization. And that's where there's confidence and inspiration. And like psychological safety, inclusion doesn't become a thing. It becomes something that helps whatever that thing is that you want to do become better. And so when we take a look at these, step one is fairness and respect. Um, do I feel discriminated against? Um, do, um, uh, do I feel like I'm part of the team? Do, not only do I think I'm being fairly uh, treated, but do I think other people uh, are feeling treated. Am I respected? Um, you know, do, do people treat me with respect? And, you know, what happens when those things don't exist? Step two, value and belonging, really feeling connected to the team. So here are some questions to ask. Am I valued for my unique contribution? Um, do others, including team members and the leader, welcome me right, fully? Right, right, right. Uh, we know that when we, that yeah, sense of belonging, yeah. when we feel included, yes. Yeah. And, and we as the leader can also tell when our team members have that sense of belonging, yes? And you, you know being a new team member here in the College of Business, when you feel like you can um, come and, make, and you're valued for a unit right. contribution and when you're saying, okay, I've come in with this new fresh perspective and then how someone else can make you feel um, as to whether or not you can ask a question or make a comment about how we do something. So that leads us to the appreciation of what one brings to right, the team right. organization, whether they're a long-standing team member or a brand new team member. Mm -hmm. uh, but Again, we have to really keep that um, at the forefront of our minds as the leaders about the the feelings, the emotions. Uh, they do have a big impact on us. And right, that right. Longingness is there, don't they? Of being felt and, and you know that, right? Even as a leader in an organization, you know that when you walk into a room, you can tell who's on the outside of the room. Right? Yes. You can tell who's on the outside of the circle. And I've heard you talk about the research you've done at Walgreens about pulling people in. Oh, yes. Walgreens has this prominently displayed sign is them in large letters with a stripe through it. T-H-E-M, them. And you see it as soon as you walk on the floor. Every team member passes by it. And that is just a constant reminder of there's no we versus them. They even have little pins to wear on the lapel. Right. Uh, <laughs> with the same logo, um, but what an artifact right, uh, right, symbolizing right, that right. culture of, in Walgreens of inclusion, of belonging. Even in the cafeteria, it's been said, no one knows who has a disability and who doesn't. Everyone sits right, together right. Uh, so that no one feels like they're on the, the outside. But that's, a great, the that's a great example. You talked about the artifact, right? That's a great yes. example that a leader has established a culture and you're using artifacts and language and you're pulling people in yes. to the point where it doesn't matter, you know, whether or not you had a disability or not. In the case of Walgreens, it shouldn't matter what color you are, or what your education is. It's about pulling people in and, and making sure that they feel like there's unconditional acceptance. And that is one of the most important parts that I think we miss when we talk about diversity and inclusion. And, and I don't think we ever get to the other letters, right? Because right. we don't feel like we belong. And if you don't feel like you belong, you're not going to make an investment. So, so. Exactly. Here's the third step to inclusion. Do I trust those on my team? Or do you trust my immediate supervisor? Are we empowered to act? Is there enthusiasm and vitality for what we yeah, do? Yeah, yeah. After all, there should be. If there's not, and what, if there's not, we need to examine why not? And then go back to, is there shared accountability? Like right, the example right. yeah. with WD-40. And then, am I confident in our abilities as a team? Yeah. And I think the, the thing here that you highlight that's really important is the fact that, you know, trust comes back into the play. But there's also accountability. Not only is the leader accountable to creating this culture, but me as an employee, am I being held accountable to engaging? 
right? Or am I sitting in the corner waiting yes. for someone to reach out to me? What's my accountability to engage? Yes. Give you a brief introduction to psychological safety, and we talked a little bit about how you measure it. We talked about what it is, what it isn't. We've even talked a little bit about uh, some manager tactics and strategies to be more effective. And I think we can come back to the parable of the bummer land, right? And there's, again, a reason why parables are so strong. It doesn't matter where you're from or where, you're, where you've been. Everybody understands the story. And so the, the parable of the bummer lamb allows us or reminds us that we're all lost sheep and we're all trying to figure it out. And we all want to belong to the flock. And sometimes we don't know how to do that. So it's up to the leaders to create this environment of trust and respect and caring and belonging and value so that we bring everyone in and we can take advantage of everyone's skills. Absolutely. So continue to seek out those bummer lambs in your organization. We appreciate you being part of this session and encourage you to feel free.